Good evening. I hope you all are doing well and healthy. I'm coming to you from uh, Second Baptist. I know that the uh, roads are uh, somewhat unsafe. Uh, so hopefully no one is tuning in while you're driving. Just watch it later if you are. I want to make sure we're being safe uh, traveling. And as always, want to make sure we are being safe uh, with the ongoing pandemic. All of us are tired of it. All of us wish it would be over. Uh, but wanting it and wishing it to be over uh, does not mean we um, uh, put ourselves or other people in danger. So let's make sure we're taking all the necessary precautions we can to keep each other safe. And that includes uh, being vaccinated. That includes uh, good evening. That includes uh, prayerfully consider being vaccinated, but also um, uh, boosted and all of that. Yes, check with your physicians. Uh, they know your health history and your conditions. We want to make sure that's taken into consideration. Uh, but the vaccines have been proven to be effective in helping us to uh, fight COVID if, uh, unfortunately, we contract it. But it would also help us to protect, um, protect ourselves and others uh, from the virus in some ways as well. Um, so good to be with you. We have not been together at this hour in quite some time. I think it's been since um, September, October. And so grateful to be back together uh, as I shared with uh, the congregation on Sunday, uh, as well as the uh, last Sunday we were together in December. This time that we haven't been together uh, has been for discernment. And we, the best we can discern, we're beginning to uh, chart a path forward uh, as, as best we can discern that God wants us to go. As I shared on Sunday uh, during the sermon, uh, we are uh, going to do what Jesus told the church to do then, now, and always, and that is seek to uh, be disciples as well as be a part of the discipleship process. And so as we move forward for Bible study, the way we're going to approach it initially is through a series entitled The Five Star Church. I want to thank our media ministry for uh, having the handouts available as well as information regarding our secondary sources uh, on the website, if you want that information, go to our website. The link is there in the comments, secondbaptistbc.org. Also want to, uh, to thank uh, Sister Eunice for having the information available in the church office for those who would like it. And it's the secondary source of Bible study, the same title, the Five Star Church. Uh, so let's get right into it. Uh, all of us in some shape, form, or fashion particularly in 2022, are familiar with uh, five-star ratings or just some type of star ratings. Um, when this book was written, it was originally published the first time in 1999. It discussed restaurants and hotels. And we know we don't want to stay in a hotel. When we travel, we're not going to stay in a raggedy ho hotel. We're not going to stay in a dirty hotel. We're not going to stay in a hotel that has poor customer service. In fact, if we get somewhere and the standard not there, the first thing we're going to do is go back to the desk and let them know the room is not up to par. We smell something. We see something. Uh, and then we give them maybe one opportunity to give us another room that is up to par. If it's not up to par, guess what we're going to do? We're going to another hotel. And we're probably going to go to a hotel that we have some familiarity with. Same thing goes with restaurants. We don't eat everybody's food, nor do we eat at every restaurant. Uh, I know somebody might say, well, I eat at Waffle House. Well, Waffle House might be the only exception uh, that some people have in terms of eating somewhere that might not have the best cleanliness. And I'm somewhat being joking, but uh, being someone who has family from the South and when we travel through the South, Waffle House might be that one exception. But we, we certainly don't want to be a Waffle House church. We don't want any church to be a Waffle House church. Uh, leave that there. In our day and age, we also have five-star ratings or, or rating systems that include one to five stars with everything. You see on the outline, you have Uber or Lyft. 
and then we also have the Google reviews. When we look at when we have a, a Uber drive, our driver usually asks us when we get out to give them a five star rating. When we go online, particularly when we're out of town or we are looking at uh, a new service, a new business that we're looking at, not only are we going to put the name of that organization in the search engine, we're going to click on the button that says reviews. And on that button that has reviews, the first thing we see is how many stars that particular organization averages. Uh, and I believe even on Facebook now, you go to a church's page, an uh, organization's page, and there's a rating on there. And it shows you out of five stars what is rated by other people. And that rating has some bearing on whether or not we are going to go any further with uh, going to that organization, buying the food, going to that hotel, and visiting the church, even if it is in our day and time visiting virtually. And that's fair. That's understandable because we have inside of us a desire to to be a part of excellence. We don't want um, we don't want to go somewhere and we're not treated the way we know we should be treated. We don't want to go somewhere, particularly in this day and age where we feel like it's unclean because unclean equals unsafe. What's interesting is the first thing that we were told when the pandemic began was to make sure we were washing our hands thoroughly. Number one, that means there, you know, a lot of people not washing their hands, maybe at all, uh, but some people certainly weren't washing their hands thoroughly. And that goes to overall cleanliness, that if we were more attentive to cleanliness, then that would go a long way uh, with some of the stuff with the pandemic. Say more about that in a moment in terms of cleanliness, not necessarily the pandemic. But when we look around reviews, watch the movie with Jabari yesterday, and I went to uh, see who was in the movie because I wasn't familiar with some of the voices of the people voicing the characters on the movie. And I noticed that on that site, I believe it's IMDb, there is a rating system. Everywhere we look, there's a rating system. And you better believe, in case you didn't know before right now, people rate churches. And honestly, that's okay. Because, as we'll get to at the end of our outline, Scripture calls us to live lives of excellence. Therefore, God calls us to live lives of excellence. And that excellence is inside of us in the person of the Holy Spirit because we expect it everywhere else. And hopefully we expect it at the church. And prayerfully, that impacts how we move forward individually, how we move forward as families, and also how we move forward as a church. And I both mean Second Baptist in particular, but I mean the church global as well, because we're in a unique time and we have a unique opportunity as a result of this pandemic that God has given us a unique opportunity to move forward. OK, so people actually rate churches. Now, we do have, in some sense, the rating system online as well. But the real way ratings are communicated with uh, churches is by word of mouth. I guarantee you, if, if you're joining us online, I know uh, there are a few here. If you enjoy coming to church, at some time you invite other people to church or to watch church online. I guarantee it. If you don't, you won't. And it goes word of mouth is always the number one tool of marketing. You can go to any company, any organization. Anyone that works in marketing and they'll tell you as good as social media is, as effective as it can be on social media, websites, so on and so forth. And we have to utilize those resources. The number one way to market is word of mouth, because if we hear from someone we trust, someone who knows us and knows our expectations that a place is good, a, a person's communication style is good. Uh, uh, a TV show is good, a movie is good, then that is going to motivate us more than anything else to give it a chance, to be open to it. And the church is no different. Uh, and in fact, and we'll get to this in a statement of summation, I'll wait till we get to that statement of summation, but the church should be a leader in that regard. So here's our statement of summation in the form of a question. So really there's a question of, of summation. Here's the question. 
How do we cultivate a church that has a quality mindset in all areas of fellowship? How do we cultivate that? So here are some, here's a list and it's not exhaustive. I'm sure there are other uh, explanations or indicators of quality that you can add to this list. But here's a list of what uh, means quality. Great service. Again, go to a hotel, go to a restaurant, go to a car dealership or a mechanic. Go get your hair done. There's an expectation that we have, and rightly so, of great service. And that's what the church is known to be. We are created to serve God and serve other people. The church should also have great service. Consistency, the second bullet, consistency in striving to meet the needs of people. Where we go and what is offered in terms of meets our need is dictated by that place. We go to a restaurant, there'll be some needs that are the same as a hotel, but not necessarily the same. A restaurant is not interested in us being comfortable for an extended period of time, whereas a hotel is, right? A hotel is, may have a restaurant, may not, because their number one priority is not necessarily feeding us, whereas a restaurant it is. Both of them want to be clean. Both of them want to have great customer service. Both of them want to have a welcoming environment. Uh, but a piece of a restaurant is they don't want it to be too comfortable. Notice most restaurants do not have cushions in their seats because they want us to eat, enjoy ourselves, but they also want us to get out so other people can come in. And there's nothing wrong with that because they're going to create an experience or try to create an experience that's comfortable for what they want to do. And we have to take that in consideration for the church and what are we trying to cultivate? What is the atmosphere we're trying to create for people that come to the building and now who join us in an online experience? And what is the goal we're trying to meet? What is the plan we have so that people have an excellent experience, which for us equals an opportunity to be to experience God as we work with God for people's souls to be saved and lives to be transformed? OK, go on to the next line. Signage. Uh, when we talk about signage, uh, we go to any store, most stores or stores that we'll go to consistently, they have such good signage that we may not even have to ask anyone who works there where to go. We we'll go to Meijer, Walmart, Target. We see where the restrooms are, clearly. Now, it may take us a while to look, but eventually we're going to find a sign. And the next time we go in, we're going to remember where it is. We want to know what the men's section is. There's going to be a large sign that says, we want to know what the women's section is, kids, baby. Uh, we want to know what toys are. We want to know what sporting goods. All of that signage is there clear. Go to, go to Meyer, Kroger, Walmart, a Super Walmart. Not only will you have signage for grocery, but there will be some summary of that aisle of what's in that aisle to help us as we're shopping and also to help our experience shopping. So we have to ask ourselves, do we have signage for people to come into the building to know everything is that they need? In particular, in this pandemic and going forward and how normal is changing, it's better to have quality signage to limit the interactions of people, uh, particularly when it comes to health and safety considerations. We also want to not only have signage, but quality signage. Quality signage suggests that even in something that may seem as, as trivial and little as signage, we care about even that stuff. And if we care about signage, then we'll care about the bigger things, making sure we have a clean bathroom, a clean smelling bathroom as well. Uh, we don't have cobwebs in the corner. We got clean uh, glasses and clean mirrors. We have hand sanitizer available, all of that type of stuff. We have the mask. And I'm grateful that a lot of this we already have in place here at Second Baptist. But even with signage, if we have quality signage, that is an indicator that other places are going to have quality as well, are going to have as much detail given to them. We look at facilities. That is a word that is in reference to the building. Uh, what does the building look like? Is it clean? What does it smell like? Uh, am, do I feel safe when I'm in the building? Do I have enough space uh, when I'm in the building with other people? When I'm in a classroom, how is that experience for me? What, what is the sound system like? What am I, how, am I, how are my senses engaged completely? 
people have that and, and you have that. So we have to consider that when it comes to even the church, because when we go to other establishments, that's considered. And again, we should be leaders in that regard. Publicity, that's marketing. And we have to we have to remember, particularly in this age of online shopping, online church, online everything. People visit the church online and virtually and on social media before they'll ever come in person. There is value in being in person, but the reality is everything we do now is going to be in person and online. And so now we're giving more attention to that. But the reality is really for the last 15 plus years, attention has to be given to uh, how does the church look online and I'm also looking to see what information is available. If I if I am married, I'm probably looking for some indication that this church cares about my marriage, my the health of my marriage, the development of my marriage. If I have children, grandchildren, what is there available for my child and grandchild for their holistic growth and development? Is this church doing ministry? Are they feeding people? Are they clothing people? Are they a part of the rehabilitation of people? Uh, do they care about people from the womb to the tomb? There are all of these. There are all of these questions that are asked by people if they're introduced to a church. If we tell somebody we are members of Second Baptist and we invite them to join us online or in person, most people are going to go to the website to do some additional investigation. They're going to do like uh, CIS or CSI all those shows. They're going to do some investigation. They're going to go to the Facebook page to see. Uh, the quality of the pictures. You can go to the Facebook page and read. They check for grammatical errors. We've noticed the importance of having clear audio, clear visual. Um, we've noticed that, you know, people are watching in this day and age in terms of cleanliness, the sanitation practice. Are people wearing masks? Are they physically distanced? And, and justifiably so. And all of that goes into whether or not it's a five star experience. For people and for us. And that is all a part of the publicity because people are looking uh, before they're leaving home to come, particularly now uh, with these additional safety measures that we're taking. And quite honestly, we probably should have been taken a long time ago. And I say that because the coronavirus is a cousin of the flu and the cold, which means it's not going away and which means we have to be prepared to to take these measures long term in some shape, form or fashion written materials. People are going to read to see how we communicate. Um, they're going to look at the they're going to look at punctuation. They're going to look at the presentation of it. They're going to be listening to see how we communicate to see if it fits them. So I'm not necessarily saying we have to be we have to be um, uh, politically correct all the time and all of that, because by definition, the church is countercultural. But at the same time, we have to always seek to operate at a level of excellence. So we are aware in everything that we do that there are eyes looking at it. Uh, and I'll share in a statement of summation why we have to do that. Then we go to the next programming. Programming is a word used by organizations, companies, hospitals, schools, so on and so forth. That's what they use. But for us, that's ministry. The question is, what ministries are in place? As well as, is this somewhere, is the church somewhere that is open to changing and adding ministries where it's needed? Uh, there has to be some flexibility that as we realize needs, that we have ministries available to meet those needs. And we can look around and we have several ministries here. Uh, we can look around and notice that we need someone. Give you an example. We added a ministry just over the last year, health and wellness ministry. And that, that, is, that is inclusive of current and retired health professionals. And they are in charge of putting our health and safety protocols in place, as well as enforcing those in conjunction uh, with our other worship support ministries. And that is a part of the mutual submission that scripture calls us to. They know what they're doing when it comes to health and safety. So we allow them and encourage them to do it. And we submit to what they do. Media ministry. I don't know. I don't know what to necessarily do with media ministry. I know a little bit and I have conversations with them, but I submit to the media ministry 
on how to do something. I may say some stuff about this is what I believe God wants us to do. How can we do this? And then we move forward. Same with the other ministries. We have conversations about what to do, but we have flexibility to work out how to do it together. And, and it is my prayer, my hope, and even my belief that as we go through this series, our next series will be on spiritual gifts, that other ministries will be revealed to us by God so that we can continue to be a church that is responsive to the need, not reactive, because reactive suggests that we're just doing something after we realize it's a need. But responsive means we're staying in the word. It's one of the reasons we're doing the wisdom piece so that we can have wisdom to notice, OK, this is coming up. So let's meet this need and we can be ahead of the curve and have some things in place uh, so that we can be responsive to needs. And that's the next bullet. Preparedness and responsiveness to culture changes. When we see this in Jesus's life. It's in the parables. Jesus told these parables to people and they knew exactly what he was talking about. It made it hit the target, so to speak. When we read those parables. Jesus tells all of these different parables and responses to questions and certain situations and settings. And if you notice, there's so many different parables because there's so many different ways Jesus had to teach it. But Jesus also knew how to meet that need for those people. And for the Pharisees, it could have been one thing. For the tax collectors, it could have been another. For his disciples, people that believed in him and were trying to follow him, it was another thing. For people who were in the multitudes who were interested in him, but not yet. He said it in a different way to them because each of them needed something different. And in the same way, we have to follow that model of Jesus. And if Jesus used those different parables to respond to different situations, we should do the same thing. Go on to the letters that we have in the New Testament. Each of those letters in the New Testament were Paul and some of the other writers trying to help people in different locations, different social situations, apply the gospel right where they were and to meet them right where they were. That's why we have there's one to Romans and that was primarily to Rome. You got Philippians and Colossians that was to Philippi and Colossus. You know, then you have Ephesians that was to Ephesus. Galatia was to Galatia. And although there's some overlap as we read them and we hear some of the same thing, there's also some stuff that's exclusive to that letter because there's some specific issues that need to be addressed in those churches and in those geographical and social locations. And the same thing goes for all of the churches open in Jesus name. Now, we consider the time in which we live It's a pandemic going on everywhere. But we are Second Baptist are in Bay City, in Bay County, in Michigan. And so what we have going on, what we need to address is not necessarily identical to a church in Nashville, Tennessee or Shreveport, Louisiana or Miami, Florida or Waco, Texas or Los Angeles, California. There's going to be some overlap because what Jesus says does not change how to apply what Jesus says. It can be different for different reasons. And so you and I have to uh, have that, that, that flexibility, that adaptability and that openness to do that. So here's our statement of summation. And I've almost said it a couple of times. I've been trying to wait to say it after all of that list. But here it is. Jesus's intention is for his church to be leaders in excellence and service. Because we have the highest stakes, eternity. Again, Jesus' intention is for his church to be leaders in excellence and service because we have the highest stakes, eternity. We've gone through that list and how it applies to organizations, how it in some way uh, we can see it in the business world of some sort, all the different businesses we mentioned. And at the end of the day, a business of any sort is there to make a profit. Their concern, even when they have quality customer service, is with the goal of making this money as much money as possible. Whereas for the church, our goal is to serve God and serve people, to be a part of God's perfect will being done on earth as it is in heaven. That is people accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior, their soul being saved, their lives being transformed and us going on that transformation journey called sanctification together. That is about eternal life. And if you and I believe the Bible, we believe what we teach, we believe what we preach, that informs the excellence we live with. OK, because we believe that eternity is the most important consideration that we should have. Not money, not fame, not attention, none of that. 
but God to save people's souls based on the finished work of Christ and God to continue to transform us and all people that are saved to look more like his son Jesus. And if we believe that that informs us wanting to be people of excellence and therefore a community of faith of excellence so that we can serve God's people for that to happen in between the walls and also outside of the walls as we are part of what God is doing in this community and all the way out to the end of the world. Okay. If you have questions, as always, please ask them. I'll do my best to answer them, even if I don't see them to afterwards in the comment section. Questions, comments, concerns yet? Okay. Let's look at what the Bible says about this, because that's what's most important. It's not me saying it. It's not our secondary source saying it. It's not uh, just talking around it. But let's hear what the Bible says about the first passage I'd like us to, to hear uh, is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. You'll see there on the handout a sub bullet with Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40, Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34, and Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. We're not going to read those, but three of the four writers of the Gospels made sure to include Jesus quoting this passage. That's how important it is. Uh, and you can read those sections to here and I'll give a little uh, insight into the Luke passage because we talked about it extensively on last year. But Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four through nine. Tonight I have the New Revised Standard Version. That's, here is what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And with all your might, keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. So let me just summarize that. That is know it. That's knowledge. Feel it in your heart and take it with you wherever you go. Teach it to your children and your grandchildren so that it's cultivated for generations and put it all around you so that you bump into it all the time and remind yourself to live it out. So in other words, it should be everywhere all the time at the same time. God is omnipresent. Everywhere, all the time, at the same time. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside us when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And as we talked about on Sunday, he promises to be with us to the end of the age, end of the earth. Both apply. Wherever we go, for however long we're here, living for him, Jesus promises to be with us. So we have no reason not to do what Jesus says do at a level of excellence. And, and as we'll see in a moment, Jesus uh, helps us through Paul to see have some additional motivation. Remember the context of Deuteronomy. This is written hundreds of years after the children of Israel had lost their way based on their actions and they had forgotten the law of the Lord because they were not obeying the law of the Lord. And so this is a reminder to them of what they should have been doing and what should have been being taught to the children and grandchildren and for generations and here's an example of why it's important for you and I to have our children and grandchildren as a part of the discipleship process as well. So as they grow up, they have word in them. So when everything is going on around them, they can respond with that word because what is in us comes up and comes out. All right. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want, to, want us to hear that. It's another place where. Excellence is discussed again. Those three passages there in that sub bullet are just a reminder that Luke 10 is uh, the story of the Samaritan and the Levite uh, uh, and the priest and, and the person who was in trouble. And the priest and the Levite did not help him, but the Samaritan did. And Jesus tells them as well as us uh, that our actions should be reflective of the Samaritan and, and that that is excellence. Because remember what the Samaritan did. He took care of the, of the person that was in trouble, 
But not only to take care of it in the moment, they committed to take care of the person until they were they were whole. So there was there was a uh, putting themselves. There was a sacrifice of putting themselves in danger. There was a financial commitment. There was health care administered. There was lodging given. And then there was a commitment until that person was whole to be a part of that person's life until wholeness was achieved. And that is a commitment that Jesus made to you and I and as his disciples that we make to everyone else. And there are so many different ways that we can be a part of that. And it starts as members of the body of Christ, as the church. Uh, this is an election year in Michigan, so we're going to be talking about that in relation to uh, how we vote and how we engage the election process and how we hold our, our uh, leaders accountable for that to happen so that politics and our tax money and on down the line is used as a means of grace uh, and obedience to God. OK, uh, go with me again to First Corinthians, chapter nine. Uh, verses 19 to 23. I want to read it and then I'll explain it. So bear with me if you would. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one Outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessing. Now some people have read this passage and communicated this passage saying that Paul was being a chameleon. That is not what Paul is saying there. What Paul is saying is that he chose in those situations to not necessarily try to make life black and white, to not just go, is this right? Is this wrong? But he tried to do what was best for the person without disobeying scripture. And that is the excellent, that is excellence that is at a, at a definition as well, because what Paul is saying, I want to do everything I can without disobeying scripture so that Jesus can save someone's soul and transform their lives. And you and I, if we have that attitude, we have that posture, we have that disposition, then we can be a part of it too. And that is going to inform everything that we do. A couple of chapters later, you see that chapter 12, verse 12 to chapter 13, verse 13. That is the passage where he, that's where we get the language that the church is the body of Christ. Because he talks about, the physical body as a metaphor for the body of Christ, where he says, when we walk to a door, the foot doesn't try to open the door because that's the hand's job. The hand doesn't try to walk because that's the foot's job. The knee doesn't try to bend like the elbow because the knee bends back, the elbow bends forward. And what he's saying is, and those people there knew exactly what he was talking about because of some of the athletic games that went there and because they had a human body themselves, we know that our body has different body parts that are made for different functions. And if the body parts work together, that is an example of a healthy, whole body. And Christianity and discipleship is similar, that if all of us submit to God, we learn our spiritual gifts, we operate in our spiritual gifts, Jesus promises to meet everybody's needs through us, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, and otherwise. The challenge becomes us doing that. It's hard for us to submit, and sometimes it's hard for us to serve people, uh, find where we are to serve, and then stay in our own lane. And, and we, can see, we can see what happens when we don't stay in our own lane. We see a lot of crashes. We see a lot of pain. Uh, we see a lot of hurt. We see a lot of money being wasted. And all of that. We know people that if they get in an accident, they refuse the ambulance because they don't want to pay what the ambulance costs. Or they go and then they're mad, not, cause, not that they're getting the care they need, not that they're getting healthier, they're being treated, getting back to holiness, but they're mad about the money. And unfortunately, similar things happen in the church uh, when it comes to our priorities and our focus. And if we can get to and stay in a place 
where we acknowledge that we are all created to fit together and work together, again, everyone's needs will be met. Everyone have access to the wholeness that God desires. So that's what that is. And it's important to note, particularly as we're talking about some of this and as we move forward with these comparisons to five star businesses and organizations, that the church is not an organization. The church is an organism. It is made up of people uh, that are to fit together like this metaphorical human body. It is an organism. It is living. It is active. It is to be in some sense on the move and all of that. So it's important to know that it's an organism and we don't operate exactly like a business. We operate based on scripture. We don't operate based on trying to get a profit. We don't operate uh, uh, based upon hiring and firing people, so on and so forth. What the, the Bible gives us all that information how to, how, to, how to do that. And that is why we do stuff differently. That is why we have forgiveness to interject into situations and patience and faithfulness and loyalty. Uh, when we get on our job, that's not my necessarily be the case. Uh, uh, I, I've been fired from a job before and, and the Lord had told me to leave. And so in hindsight, I have to accept that I was fired. I'm not mad at the organization anymore. I was at first. I'm not mad at the organization anymore. Um, but we, we don't just fire people immediately when something goes wrong. There is a there, there is a way in the method and methods given to us in Scripture uh, to give people the opportunity for restoration, just like God gave, gave us an opportunity to restore. It's part of our salvation, but also the fact that God forgives us for our sins. And there's parameters for that forgiveness and expectations for that forgiveness. But it's important to remember the church is an organism, not an organization. OK, first, I'm sorry, the last we got two more passages and we're done. We're doing good. We're doing, we're doing good. Colossians chapter three. And I have to admit, this is uh, these two verses. Um, and as God is continuing to mature me are among the most convicting verses that I read in Scripture. I'm going to read it to you and I'll explain, explain what I mean. Colossians chapter three, verses 23 and 24. Whatever your task Put yourselves into it as done for the Lord and not your masters, since you know that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You serve the Lord Christ. Other translations read a little bit better, in my opinion, where it says uh, in that verse 23, whatever you do, put yourselves into it. Do it as you do it unto the Lord. In other words, everything that we do. Do it as if we're doing it for Jesus. One thing that um, if I don't have to do, I won't do, and that's washing dishes. I don't know why washing dishes bother me so much. I, I've never liked washing dishes. I'm not proud of it. I really don't necessarily want to be sharing this with you, but I, so far this is the best example I can give. I do not like washing dishes. However, I do like eating off clean dishes. So that, that's one motivation to wash dishes when I need to. But on a higher, holier level, as I was reading this, I was reminded to wash dishes as if I'm washing those dishes for Jesus to eat off of. Now, that goes to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25. You read Matthew chapter 25, 31 to 46. Jesus talks about those who are his sheep and those who he will proudly acknowledge as his sheep. He says they are people who cared about the least of these. They, they clothed people. They fed people. They were concerned with rehabilitating people who had made mistakes in life and committed crimes instead of just throwing them in jail. Uh, they gave them shelter. They gave them clean, healthy water to drink and encompassed in that it is really essentially they were a part of the wholeness I seek to give to people. They were a part in giving that wholeness to people and, and helping people to achieve that wholeness. And so what Jesus is saying in that passage, what he's saying through Paul in this passage and other places throughout Scripture, is that everything that you do, do it as if you're doing it for me. Doing as if I'm going to be the one walking in the doors to receive the service you're going to render as an usher, as a nurse. I'm the one that I'm going to hear you sing in the sanctuary because he does hear it. I'm the one that's going to hear you teach. I'm the one that's going to hear you preach. Uh, clean that car as if you're coming to pick me up. 
Keep it vacuumed as if I'm going to get in that vehicle. I blessed you with it. I want you to take care of it. Take care of your spouse as if I was your spouse. On down the line, and, and it, is, it, is, it is that type of idea that Jesus wants us to have, that everything that we're doing, we're doing as if we're doing it for him. In reality, we are, but it helps us mentally and otherwise that if we consider that I'm, I'm, I'm washing this car because Jesus is who I'm going to pick up. I'm vacuuming it out because Jesus is the one that's going to ride in it with me. Uh, I'm preparing this meal because I'm feeding, it's as if I'm feeding Jesus and I'm cleaning this or cleaning that. And, and think about that not only uh, on a daily basis, but also when it comes to God's house, because we are to treat God's house as it's God's house. We would treat it as if Jesus is physically going to come visit, visit the church for some of those meetings and some of those fellowships and some of those services. That's what is meant there in that Colossians 3 and 23 to everything that we do to do is that we're doing it directly for Jesus. Then the last passage, and we're almost done for tonight. James chapter one, excuse me, James chapter one, uh, verses 19 through 25. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and Welcome the meekness of implanted word that has been power to save your souls. Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and persevere. Being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. In other words, uh, all of us, again, as we started, all of us want quality. We seek quality. We expect quality. And we apply that to the church. And the way we apply that to the church is by living out scripture on a daily basis and living it out when it comes to serving God and serving his people. On a daily basis, not just when we're here at the church, not just on Sunday, not just on Thursday, not just when we have ministry meetings, at home too, because that's a part of living the Christian life. At work and other places so that Jesus always has an opportunity to shine forth through us. And in particular with this series, we are looking at how can we do that in God's house so that we can continue to be a church that God does ministry through that we work with God, we serve with God to meet the needs of all people and even our creation in a sense, such that this can be a place where Jesus is seen and experienced so that souls are saved, lives are transformed. Again, it talks about that being doers of the word. And it says that we can look in the mirror and forget who we were. We know who we were back then. And we know who we are now. We know who God wants us to be. And that is even the motivation to do that, to be better, to obey scripture more, to live for God more, such that other people have that opportunity to see it, so that we can hear what we want to hear when we see God face to face. And that's what it is. If we have it inside of us, it's going to come up and out of us. And we can be people of excellence. We can be families of excellence. And yes, we can be a church of excellence. Here's a statement of summation. And we're done. I have not seen any questions. So we'll be done after this. The best churches are not perfect, but they are forever pursuing the idea. Again, the best churches are not perfect, but they are forever pursuing the idea. Of course, we're imperfect people. We're not going to always get it right. Therefore, we're an imperfect church. We're not going to always get it right. But we are going to strive to be the best we can be. Attention to detail. Striving for excellence in every ministry, as well as collectively as a body of believers. I pray that you continue to join us for this um, for this Bible study. I think it's going to be a major blessing to our church as we've shared. Uh, if you know someone, particularly uh, Second Baptist members, you know someone uh, that was unable to join us, share with them so that they can get this so we can move forward collectively uh, and in tandem. Of course, you know, I love you. Please stay safe and be wise. Uh, invite you to join us on Sunday at noon. 
Uh, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 15 for the next several weeks as we continue our focus on uh, discipleship. Also have some special announcements coming your way uh, for the church. Again, stay safe, be wise. I invite you to join us on Sunday at noon, and uh, we'll see you then.